and I don't think philosophy really is in a different business from science. I think both science and philosophy are trying to construct uh, good, true, uh, synthetic theories about what's going on in the world. Hmm. But sometimes the problems facing us in constructing such a theory isn't that we're short of data and we need to do more experiments or observations or anything. It's that we're in some kind of theoretical tangle. Uh, uh, we've got kind of different ideas, different assumptions that are leading us into confusion and paradox. Hello, my geeselings. It is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 62. This episode is with David Papineau, who's Professor of Philosophy of Science at King's College London, and he also teaches half of every year at the CUNY Graduate Center. And this episode was really nice for two reasons. One, David it has worked across a really wide variety or a wide array of philosophical areas. So he's worked in philosophy of science, philosophy of physics, philosophy of mind, metaphysics, and, and more. So he was really just a terrific interlocutor. And secondly, this is the first time that philosophy of science, just as philosophy of science, not philosophy of physics or philosophy of race or something else like that, has really been front and center in a Robinson's Podcast Universe episode. This was the best introduction to the philosophy of science that I could have hoped for. We talk about four or five big questions in the philosophy of science. So one, we talk about the philosopher's role in science. I mean, if you're not an academic, or if you don't know much about contemporary philosophy, you might be surprised to hear that there is a such thing as philosophy of science, though many people know of it from like Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolution. So we discuss just what the philosopher's role in science is and how it's shifted. So just quite broadly, I think the general shift has been from studying science as outsiders. So what science should ideally be like uh, in the case of Thomas Kuhn, how science evolves into a more interwoven discipline. So now, like with guests I've had, Tim Maudlin and David Albert, philosophy of science is sort of nestled into a science. And as philosophers of physics, they're dealing with problems in the foundations of quantum mechanics. We also talk about scientific realism. So this is the question of whether or not we should be ontologically committed, at least as I understand it, to the posits of science, so physical theory, like, should we be realists about electrons, quarks, all these sorts of things that we can never observe, uh, because our theories suggest that they exist. We also talk about the replication crisis. And in the case of psychology, plenty of landmark, very important studies were not able to be reproduced. So you have this earth shattering result. And then when you try to repeat it, you find that, oh, it doesn't work. And David talks about why this is. And then last, we also talk about causation. And in particular, David's uh, statistical theory of causation. So for some useful background information, you should check out David's episode of the Philosophy Bites podcast in which he talks about scientific realism. You should also check out Katie Papineau's art. That's David's daughter. And if you are watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, you'll have seen the, the album art. I used one of her paintings. Last, you can keep up with me on Twitter or wherever at, at RobinsonEarhart.com. But you can, more importantly, keep up with David on his website, davidpapineau.co.uk or via Twitter at David Papineau. Now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with David as much as I enjoyed having it. I've also spoken with Hugh Price on the podcast, who 
might be a good candidate for this. Yeah. And I've also had on philosophers of physics like David Albert and Tim Maudlin. But like I mentioned before mm -hmm. we started, I feel pretty safe saying that you're mm -hmm. my first guest who is really a, a general philosopher of science, among other things, of course. Mm -hmm. But And I don't think I have to go what? out on a what? limb to say that there are far fewer philosophers of science than there are scientists. So how was it that you ended up working mm -hmm. in philosophy of science? And why did that appeal to you more than the perhaps more obvious alternative, which is being a scientist? Interesting question. Uh, <laughs> my, no, my first degree was in, in maths and, mm -hmm. uh, with this, with a uh, specialization in Stats, mathematical right. statistics. Yeah. And so I did that for four years at my first, my first degree in South Africa, I started very young. Mm -hmm. And, but as I was coming to the end of that time, I wanted to, to switch. And kind of at the time, I thought, you know, I, I want to do something more interesting, more exciting. I always thought, you know, I was pretty good at maths, but uh, uh, I wanted to broaden my wings. But in in retrospect, I wasn't really any good at maths at all. I, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I could do all the exams, I could learn the theorems, I could learn the problem solving techniques, but I never found myself. I, mean, I didn't think of it at the time. I never found myself trying to explore any mathematical subject areas and thinking, could I prove this or did this follow from that and so on. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so it was quite right that I should, that I got out of maths and switched to philosophy. In philosophy, I, I, I don't have a problem uh, right. kind of pursuing problem areas and thinking mm -hmm. about them on. So it was, it was clearly the right right choice. But when I then I went to Cambridge in England and did. Uh, philosophy as an undergraduate for two years because uh, you could do a, a second first degree in two years at that time in a different subject and then I did a PhD in three years and then and then I started started lecturing those were the days I mean I, I, I had kind of uh, uh, scarcely any philosophical training and I've been catching up ever since but at Cambridge then they had a very weird system which was in your final year you either did what the Germans call uh, uh, practical philosophy, political philosophy, ethics, history of philosophy, or you did, well, it wasn't just theoretical philosophy, it was basically uh, logic and maths and philosophy of science. And so my final year, I just did options in mathematical logic and philosophical logic, philosophy of maths, philosophy of science. I kind of naturally pushed in that direction. So... I was kind of categorized as a philosopher of science. And so when I did my PhD, I started off with Ian Hacking and I was going to work on, on statistical inference, uh, logical statistical inference. Uh, uh, wasn't quite such a subject now as it is, I mean, then as it is now. Uh, but I kind of got bored with that too. And I, I started doing Kuhn and Feyerabend and, and uh, rationality and relativity. And so I just, yeah, that's how I became a philosopher of science. In fact, uh, I have rather a wandering eye philosophically and uh, quite soon into my philosophical career, I found myself getting interested in things that didn't really count as philosophy of science. So I don't, I don't know if I really count, well, I, yeah, I do count myself as a philosopher of science, but not exclusively as a right. philosopher of science. Right. So I don't think I'm a philosopher of science and therefore not a philosopher of mind or mm. not a metaphysician. Uh, so presumably, I mean, you don't introduce yourself as a philosopher of science, but for purposes of um, conversation or explanation. Depends. Depends who I'm talking to. Okay. Depends who I'm talking to. Yeah. Well, what I was going yeah. to. Uh, truth so, is. When I'm with non-philosophers of science, I, I I I like to come across as philosopher of science, and when I'm with philosophers of science, I tend to feel that I'm more of a general philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Well, what I was going to ask is, when you're on an airplane or trapped in an elevator, maybe maybe this never happens, but mm -hmm. 
How do you explain what it is that a philosopher of science does? Because I imagine that the gut reaction of not just oh. non-philosophers of science, but non-philosophers, period, uh, who hears that there are philosophers of science would be something along the lines of, well, well, don't the scientists exhaust everything there is to really do with science? What's philosophy got to do with it at all? Interesting question. And kind of thing, natural thing to say in response to that has rather changed since I started doing philosophy, philosophy of science. So back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, it was kind of a, a topic called scientific method. And, uh, you know, there were inductivists and the Popperians and the hypothetico deductive method and so on. And it was kind of philosophy setting itself up kind of outside science as the kind of authority on how science uh, did and perhaps should proceed. Mm. And uh, you might well wonder, you know, did, did the scientists really need advice from the philosophers about that? But that subject's rather, I mean, that's philosophy of science, but there's also kind of philosophy in science, like philosophy of physics and philosophy of biology and uh, uh, lots of other uh, philosophical topics thrown up within science. And that's become much more what philosophy of science, philosophy of science does now than, than this kind of general methodology debates about scientific method. Myself, I think that those debates about scientific method are hugely misguided that uh, the idea there's something, the scientific method that philosophers have some kind of special access to seems to me just, just mistaken. I think uh, uh, scientists use whatever methods they can see are going to be effective methods at finding out the truth in which, whichever area they're working in, and they might be different methods in different, different areas. So I think the question of, of scientific method itself becomes an issue within science rather than about science. It's something mm -hmm. that scientists themselves are concerned with when they're uh, figuring out how you, how you can get at the truth about biochemistry or uh, paleoanthropology or um, cosmology. They all need different methods and the scientists can figure it out. But that now brings me to the, 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 the real interesting part of your question is, is what a philosopher is trying to do uh, addressing these subjects within science. Why, why can't the scientists address them? And my answer to this is something to do with my, my picture of what philosophy is. And I don't think philosophy really is in a different business from science. I think both science and philosophy are trying to construct uh, good, true, uh, synthetic theories about what's going on in the world. Hmm. But sometimes the problems facing us in constructing such a theory isn't that we're short of data and we need to do more experiments or observations or anything. It's that we're in some kind of theoretical tangle. Uh, uh, we've got kind of different ideas, different assumptions that are leading us into confusion and paradox. Uh, so think think about, you know, interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, understanding the direction of time. Uh, think about the problem of altruism in, in biology. I mean, uh, altruism oughtn't to evolve because animals are, uh, are selected to have more offspring than the other animals in their species, which argues that they shouldn't be doing things that make the other animals have more offspring. But then if you kind of study animals, they seem to behave altruistically. That's a real puzzle. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that scientists aren't specially trained to be good at solving those puzzles. Scientists are trained to, to gather data, gather interesting okay. data that will help solve theoretical issues. They aren't trained to to unpick the assumptions that are leading them into paradox. And uh, 
And when you find a set of assumptions leading leading people within to, into paradox within science, that's a philosophical problem arising within science. And I don't say that that the scientists are no good at solving those problems or never do. Some scientists are really get engaged by those problems and think hard. So if you think about you know interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, people doing the best work there, half of them are philosophers, uh, David Albert, Tim Maudlin, mm -hmm. and half of them are, are scientists, uh, Sean Carroll, uh, Carlo Rovelli, and they're doing just the same kind of thing. Uh, so it's not a matter of demarcation. Do you count yourself as a, a, a trained philosopher or a trained scientist? It's a matter of here's a kind of problem that calls for a certain kind of thinking, and that's philosophical thinking. So that's what I like doing. And yeah. just to can I can I wrap up on this? I mean, you yeah. might think. I mean, can the philosophers really, really uh, make any contributions here? And uh, so, go back to the issue of what's the right scientific method, and tie that up with the issue I mentioned earlier. I started working with Ian Hacking on. Uh, I hate saying this, 50 years ago, uh, uh, the logical statistical inference. Uh, scientists have been taught and they all uh, uh, religiously adhere to uh, what's called frequentism, the logical significance tests, uh, rejection regions, p-values and so on. And... Uh, Philosophers for some time, and Ian Hacking was one of the first, started pointing out this, 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 all this stuff just doesn't really make sense. And, uh, and we really need to think about statistical inference in a different way, maybe a Bayesian, a Bayesian way. And, uh, and this issue has kind of come home to roost with the replication crisis. I mean, the truth is that the, Standard classical statistics uh, uh, will inevitably produce lots of false uh, confirmed results. And uh, that's what we're finding in great areas of science. And uh, the scientists have all been taught, uh, and they're all good learners that you do significance tests and rejection regions and so on, are rather slow to learn the philosophical lesson, but they're finally learning it. And it's a lesson that was first taught by by philosophers saying uh, uh, classical statistics is pretty incoherent, and it is. What you've just yeah. said reminds me. Sorry, I, I, I have a lot to say in response to that question. Does it answer the question? Yeah, it does. It does. And what, what you've just said reminds me very much of something I spoke with uh, Nick Huggett about. And he described, I mean, the progress of physics as being very much a product of the scientists on the one hand and philosophical thinking on the other mm -hmm. to help get past conceptual difficulties. And as you mentioned with altruism, the two types of training are really complementary to one another. And I also liked how you, how you described uh, both philosophy and science as being in the business of constructing good, true synthetic theories. So the way that you see science and, and yeah. philosophy are, they both have the same goals. And analytic philosophy, I mean, uses uh, this, I mean, you, you express some skepticism, some skepticism about the scientific method, but uh, it, it is much closer to science mm -hmm. than say the continental tradition. So yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I mean, it's 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 not all analytic philosophers by any means would agree with my characterization, my view of what philosophy does. I mean, there's a, there's a long mm -hmm. tradition in analytic philosophy that analytic philosophy is to do with the analysis of concepts and 
while that's not nearly as popular now that idea as it used to be it hasn't it hasn't by any means gone away and associated with that there's a much more widespread view that philosophy tim williamson's nice phrase exceptionalism is 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 philosophy it, it I'll be exceptionalist about philosophy. I really think philosophy uses a different method from the way the rest of different disciplines study study reality. And in particular, does it have some kind of a priori access to aspects of reality? And the idea that philosophy rests on or is guided by a priori intuitions in a way that science isn't, that's that's quite widespread. But I think that makes no sense. I mean, how, uh, how are, I mean, Kant's question, how is a priori knowledge of, the, I mean, of synthetic matters at all possible? And I, I, I think there's no good answer. One person I know quite well who has a very different view of what philosophy is from you is mm -hmm. Heim Gaifman at Columbia, who's a mathematician and logician. And... Mm -hmm. He does not see philosophy's role as constructing good synthetic theories because I think he's he has a sort of pessimistic uh, attitude and, and thinks all philosophical programs fail. And he sees philosophy as more playing the role of giving us insight into very deep questions and into other disciplines like math and his um, area of expertise. But... That's sort of what I thought that you might have said the role of philosophers in science mm -hmm. is, is to give insight into scientific practice. But again, it seemed like you were, uh, you, I mean, you thought that that was a bit misguided. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is an interesting issue about if the job of philosophy is what I said, and you seem to be inclined to agree uh, uh, constructing true synthetic theories of reality uh, how come it doesn't seem as progressive as science how come it uh, doesn't accumulate uh, kind of settled bits of knowledge and uh, uh, there's quite a lot to say about that uh, mm -hmm. uh, is it so obvious that it doesn't uh, maybe some of the problems are especially hard maybe there's uh, various precious mechanisms that that push human beings into intuitions that aren't in line with the truth and they have to be uh, uh, re-educated out of them every generation i mean uh, so there's a kind of constant constant yeah, struggle this... to keep the truth on the table I don't know. There's a lot, lot, lot of things one might say. Yeah, yeah. No, this conversation yeah. has taken a, a a much more meta turn than I had anticipated. But one immediate stumbling block that I find surprising that mm -hmm. comes to mind uh, might be exemplified mm -hmm. by discussions about the foundations of mathematics. Is that it's very surprising that when you get mm -hmm. down to these foundational questions people really disagree very strongly about the most basic principles. So Platonism and mathematics I mean, is a very, very basic in many ways, but the leading mathematicians can still disagree profoundly about it, or even things like choices of axioms, like the axiom mm -hmm. of choice, which I mean is, is generally accepted, but there've been huge debates over it. Plus your math is an interesting area, but there's a sense in which, despite what you say, they're clearly has been some definite progress because in philosophy of mass you sometimes get uh, philosophical theories that imply mathematical claims that get properly disproved. I mean, like like Hilbert's formalism, for instance, and uh, that's very true. Uh, all, all, all the all the all the possibilities in philosophy of mass that have been have been ruled out by technical advances in 20th century logic. I mean, that, that's quite a lot. So that's quite a lot of progress. Uh, mm -hmm. I... But I, I, I still think that there isn't consensus in the way that we might hope that there is. But yes. 
returning, I guess, maybe to mm-hmm. some of the more concrete questions or less meta questions in the philosophy of science, you start one of your courses on the philosophy of science with the question mm-hmm. of realism about scientific theories. And what does it mean to be a scientific realist? As I see it, there's kind of two elements to scientific realism. There's a kind of uh, semantic, ontological element that uh, the truth of our claims answers to an independent reality that uh, there's a gap between how things are and how we take them to be. And when you assert that, you're rejecting various views that are kind of like idealism or verificationism or internal realism, which say worries about falsity or at least radical falsity are misplaced because the nature of thought and its relation to reality doesn't leave any room for a big gap right so so a realist says no no they're, 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 in principle there's there's uh, uh, always a possibility that how reality is and how we think about it are are badly different mm-hmm. and so now once you've got that uh, ontological semantic element of realism then skepticism threatens so skepticism is the other kind of opponent to realism and so realism needs another component to to exclude skepticism and that's the claim that uh, even though reality is different from how we take it to be i mean sorry it's, it's possibly different from how we take it to be in truth we can figure out how reality is and acquire uh, true beliefs knowledge about reality. So there's the idea that, uh, first of all, reality is independent, the idealists are wrong. And secondly, but nevertheless, we can find out about it. So the skeptics are wrong. So so that's how I think of realism. It's got those two, two components. So a realist, is, so the one, one question that comes to my mind, uh, comes to mind about realism is, yeah. and maybe Quine is my inspiration here but i have the sense that a realist is committed to whatever is quantified over in our best scientific theories is that roughly on track no i think okay i'm i'm not look i I would never talk. I mean, at NYU about a year ago, uh, in a series on metaphilosophy, and they uh, asked me to do naturalism, but then they asked me to, and do Quine, right? And do Quine. Tell us all about Quine and naturalism. And, natu- and so I went and looked at Quine, and by my lights, Quine turns out not to be that naturalist or realist at all i mean there's certainly elements there uh but in the terms that i just laid out uh is there in principle always a gap between how we see things and how things really are i mean is is there any uh uh putting it the other way around is there any guarantee that our best theories uh, will inevitably be true? Quine comes out on the kind of verificationist idealist line there. Quine thinks that that worries about uh, whether a theory that uh, ideally fits all the observational data is false. He thinks those worries are misplaced. He thinks it's something about the nature of truth or reality or thought that tells us that uh, uh, a theory that that fits all the data uh, 
has to be true. And so he's uh, he's not that much of a realist. So so I'd say that the, the idea that that we're committed to what our theories quantify over is uh, uh, something that can be agreed by everybody. The idealists, the realists, and the skeptics. Uh, uh, to my mind, it's pretty much a truism. I mean, I I, I know there's various. Uh, uh, fancy fringe views in 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 analytic philosophy that that, that query quine dictum, but uh, I don't really get it. I think you know, if you say there are certain things, then then you're committed to them. Uh, I'm not. So the question is more to put it in Kantian terms, just whether mm -hmm. or not mm -hmm. we can, through science, get access to uh, the noumenon. Is that maybe a better way of framing what realism is yeah yeah okay that's good enough but i mean i mean kant packs an awful lot into what it is to be noumenal such that it becomes really very hard to see how you could uh, get access to it but uh uh i think that Something happened around 1900 that made uh, idealism very difficult to maintain. And the cat's not a straightforward idealist, of course, especially when it comes to the noumena. But if you think of all the neo and all the post-Kantians who said, look, we don't, we just don't need this notion of a noumena. There's nothing more to reality than empirical reality. Reality as appears to us, uh, you know, when properly investigated, and therefore doubts about the gap between how things are and how things appear to us are misplaced. I mean, that was the uh, dominant view in philosophy, certainly, I don't know, from 1800 to 19. 50, but it comes under terrible pressure once you have scientific theories of unobservable entities. Truth is that nobody took such theories very seriously uh, until the end of the 19th century. I mean, the, the original scientific revolution was based on mechanical philosophy, but in the 17th century, nobody was any good at figuring out what unobservable mechanisms are really there, and science kind of turned against that. Uh, Newton said it's not part of serious science. Locke agreed to try and form micro micro mechanical theories, and uh, the scientific tradition turned against all that stuff, which makes it very easy to say, look, reality is just the way things appear. I mean, uh, there's the appearances, and uh, they constitute reality, and they're available to us in observation. But uh, well, in the 19th century, we have theories of all kinds of things we can't observe, uh, atoms, um, radiation, viruses, and so on. And you can find philosophers at the end of the 19th century saying, oh, uh, we don't like this kind of stuff. It's just like Kantian noumena. We don't want to take it seriously. Uh, but... Uh, you know, just just the scientific advances made that that view seem ridiculous. So there are things that are just like the Kantian noumena, mm -hmm. i.e., reality is is in itself beyond how it appears to us in sensory experience, and it sure looks like we can find out about it. So, uh, yes, I mean, there's a sense in which uh, uh, the realist is committed to being able to find out about about noumena, but the noumena on as a kind of highly uh, distance from our uh, interaction with the world as they are in Kant. Hmm. I would like to softly push back against something that you said earlier when you said okay. that okay, it's, <laughs> it's something of a truism that we're committed to what's in our best theories. And the reason that I would want to push back against that is that, I mean, if you take like, quantum mechanics and relativity, for instance. I mean, they're, they're two of our best theories, but people know that they're incompatible. And good, good. they know that perhaps, I, well, there is a theory of everything out there that we just don't 
know yet or don't have access to. So why would anybody want to be committed to our two best theories when we know that they're not right? Did I say that we should be committed to everything quantified over in our best theories? Because if, if I said that, I don't, I, I'll take it back. Okay. Uh, uh, what I think is the truth is that we're committed to everything quantified over in the theories that we believe. But it may well be that uh, we uh, don't commit ourselves to believing our best theories precisely because we can see uh, two of our best theories are inconsistent. One of them must, at least one of them is wrong. Uh, uh, I mean, this comes up in the philosophy of mass very nicely. So, so there's the Fieldian program, which is supposed to uh, offer a route to, to fictionalism. I mean, right. I, I'm not sure that one wants to take that route, but the Fieldian program is very interesting. And he claims that uh, uh, theories that quantify over abstract mathematical entities, uh, we don't have to believe them because there's always going to be uh, a nominalist uh, uh, replacement that just deals with, with physical quantities and uh, regards the mathematical entities, the numbers, the real numbers, and so on, as, as useful imaginary structures for modeling uh, uh, the, the structure of the, of the physical quantities. And then people say, well, okay, so you can, you can do this nominalization. You've shown us how to do it for, for uh, geometry and uh, Newtonian mechanics, but come on, are you seriously going to do it for quantum mechanics and Himmelt spaces, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not going to happen, is it? And because, you know, it's a, it's a kind of pretty uh, uh, daunting uh, challenge to nominalize daunting paraphrase. those theories. Uh, yeah, but uh, the natural response from people who are uh, attracted by Fields program is to say, well, okay, uh, we can't see how to nominalize these theories but there's two explanations it's one is that is that reality itself somehow doesn't admit of nominalization because somehow it it essentially incorporates the the abstract platonist numbers and the other is we just aren't smart enough to figure out how to write out the nominalist version. Mm -hmm. There surely must be a nominalist version uh, because uh, reality itself doesn't involve, uh, sorry, concrete reality itself doesn't involve abstract numbers. I, I, I don't have to presuppose here anti-Platonism. I'm just to presuppose that there's concrete reality and surely that ought to be able to, be describable by a nominalist theory. Surely you don't need to refer to real numbers to to describe the structure of quantities like like mass and distance and so on. Uh, and so, so th there you end up in a situation where where our best theories uh, uh, preliminarily refer to the real numbers, but it's not the theory we believe about concrete reality. I mean, I don't because uh, I'm fully convinced that, that concrete reality itself doesn't involve abstract numbers. And so in principle, it ought to be able to describe it in a way that doesn't refer to the abstract numbers. But uh, we don't have such a theory on the table. Uh, uh, doesn't now, force me to be committed to the abstract numbers. Mm -hmm. Now, the scientific anti-realists mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, who might not want to be... Mm -hmm committed to the non-observable entities like atoms or god forbid they're even smaller mm -hmm. components my uh yeah. guess because I, this isn't my area is that they want to treat these objects instrumentally or as useful fictions but mm -hmm. i also would guess that nominalism doesn't play into this at all so 
but maybe it does in some way what is is there how do they cash out this fictional or this fictionalism or instrumentalism inter, instrumentalism in a way that's different from hartree's hartree field's fictionalism in mathematics okay uh First, let's let, let's get clear about the terminology. Uh, when you say anti-realist, so we had realists as people who said there's an independent reality our theories are trying to describe, and what's more, we can succeed in getting our theories to describe it accurately. Mm -hmm. And so you can oppose realism in two ways. You can say reality isn't independent of the way we think about it. Is that the idealist? Uh, which is idealism, yeah, okay. or verificationism, idealism, verificationism, internal realism. Or you can say reality is independent of the way we think about it, but we just can't know what it's like, which is skepticism. And, uh, and there's a whole history of the term anti-realism, which was invented by Dummett to refer to the idealism, but a lot of people use it to refer to the skepticism, partly because in America, skepticism is the standard alternative to realism, whereas in, in this country, uh, verificationism or, or Dummettian anti-realism is alternative. Uh, I'm just wondering which one you have in mind. I think you probably have the skeptical version in mind, which is, I mean, uh, most clearly uh, instanced by Van Frassen. I mean, Van Frassen distances himself from the so-called semantic instrumentalists who say it makes no sense to think that you can refer to an unobservable reality. He thinks, of course, you can refer to an unobservable reality and make claims about it. Uh, and no doubt these claims are true or false, it's just that we can't figure out which it is. So uh, now the question is, how does a skeptical instrumentalist like Van Frassen compare to uh, a skeptical instrumentalist like Field, uh, where Van Frassen's a skeptical instrumentalist about atoms and feels a skeptical instrumentalist about uh, the natural numbers, the real numbers. Uh, they're very similar positions. They're, uh, uh, it's, I mean, at first pass, I'll say there's no difference between the two positions. I mean, they, they've got the same attitude to these different subject areas. Uh, the, the Van Frassen, uh, uh, constructive empiricist, uh, is a skeptical fictionist about atoms and uh, a Fieldian uh, mathematical fictionist, a skeptical instrumentalist about, about real numbers and sets and so on. Uh, now, when, when one starts looking at the arguments and the details, there are interesting disanalogies between the two, two areas, but at first pass, I think the thing to say to your question is they're quite analogous positions. Does, does that seem does that seem odd to you? No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. But now, granted that yeah. there are no granted that there are many hmm. sort of uh, fine grained categorizations we can make within these three camps of realists, skeptics, and idealists. Where do you fall? Mm -hmm. Where do you fall in? I'm a, I'm, 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 I'm a pretty straightforward realist. Well, uh, maybe I'd be a qualified realist. I mean, the, to my mind, the most obvious challenge to to realism is is. Um, pessimistic meta induction from past falsity. I mean, a lot of scientific theories turn out to be wrong. We keep on rejecting theories. And uh, my view is, yeah, I mean, lo lo lots of times scientists comes up with theories and uh, uh, they turn out to be mistaken. And that's because, uh, okay, I'm going to have a pretty flat-footed response. Uh, uh, 
often the scientists overstretch themselves. They make claims that aren't fully supported by the evidence they have. And so if you mean by science whatever the scientific uh, consensus endorses at the time, I'm not going to be realist about that. Uh, I'm inclined to be realist about it only to the extent that these claims are sufficiently supported by by evidence. Uh, and one can distinguish different areas of science uh, where, so the latest consensus in cosmology or paleoanthropology, I'll be uh, kind of wait and see. I'm a bit skeptical. I mean, mm -hmm. theories like that, you know, everybody gets excited and it turns out to be wrong. And, and the reason is, I mean, the paleoanthropologists, you know, it's just got, I mean, it's, it's changing now, but in, until recently they had just a few kind of scraps of tooth right. and bone as the, the right, evidence, right. and they build all these complicated things on the basis. And, and, and the cosmologists are making very comprehensive, strong claims about the large-scale structure of space and time. And again, uh, uh, they're struggling with evidence sufficient to, hmm. to justify it's, what they claim. So but when it comes your... to chemistry at normal energy levels or, or biochemistry. I mean, I'm not, I'm not skeptical about that. I'm not skeptical that, uh, you know, somebody tells me, do you really believe that chickenpox is caused by a virus? I say, yeah, I fully believe that. That's not, that's not going to turn out to be wrong. Uh -huh. And so you, you might say that the degree of your realism is a function of how mature the science is. Mature? I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, I don't think that you know, foundational physics is immature. It's, I mean, uh, how, 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 how strong the evidence is, how much available evidence there is for the claims being made, and uh, whether the claims are commensurate to the evidence. Uh, and a, yeah. a phrase that you used a few minutes ago is pessimistic meta induction from false theories uh the pessimistic meta induction from past falsity this is this is uh you know, in in my trade this from is past. just uh 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 the media hackney phrase everybody knows what it means <laughs> okay look there's there's when you have scientific realism and the claim What's normally at issue in these debates is theories about unobservables, uh, theories about atoms, radiation, large scale such as space time, microbes, and so on. Uh, there's supposed to be two challenges to, to uh, realism. And one is the argument from underdetermination that the theories outstrip the evidence. Uh, uh, there's always going to be alternatives to the theories that we've thought of that can accommodate the evidence equally, equally well. So that's one argument. And, and that's, mind, a that's not a very realist. It's a challenge. I mean, it's a yeah, standard no. argument. Okay. But in fact, if you think about it, the, it's. I wouldn't say it's silly, but it's it's a far less telling argument than it looks at first sight. In effect, the argument is just saying that the claims you're making in science, when you, especially when you make claims about unobservables, uh, are stronger than the evidence on which they're based, i.e. the claims don't follow logically from the evidence. And uh, you're making a kind of ampliative inference. Yeah. Inference. I mean, you might, you might, you might have this worry about any inductive uh, claim. You have things that worked a certain way so far, so they're going to work that way in general into the future. And here's an alternative theory that in the future they're going to work differently. And your evidence doesn't compel the first argument, first first answer rather than the second. So the argument from underdetermination is just a complaint 
that you're making non-logical inferences. And while there was a time when philosophy thought that knowledge wasn't any good unless it was based on logically compelling uh, arguments from indubitable premises, I take it that's not what we require anymore. We don't think that a belief is ill-founded if it's not if it's not uh, demon proof, if it's not uh, based on on uh, uh, a provenance that leaves no room for error. Uh, and it's true that if you take, say, the atomic theory of matter at, at regular energy levels, the evidence doesn't compel you to believe that matter is made of atoms. The evidence leaves it open that uh, uh, there's no reality behind the large scale observable appearances. And it just so happens that all these millions of experiments produce uh, data that make it look as if matter is made of atoms. Or maybe you think there's little green men running around. They've been sent from Mars to just arrange all the experiments to fool us into thinking that there's atoms. But if you put loony theories like that to one side and you kind of consider all the evidence, there really isn't any serious room for doubt that matter mm -hmm. is made of atoms. There's an awful lot of evidence. Right. Uh, it's all inferential. I mean, uh, 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 no matter really what happens with relativity atoms, and quantum mechanics, atoms are going to be yeah. in the successor theories. Exactly. Okay. So, so, so the argument for determination is not a compelling argument against realism. And, and what one might say to the, all, all we need is we don't need our, our scientific theories to be arrived at by methods of reasoning that leave no room for error. That's too much to ask. Uh, uh, all we need is that our theories are arrived at by methods of reasoning that generally produce the truth, that are reliable, that are reliable in the actual world, even if uh, they're possible worlds in which they lead us astray. But then there's the argument that, look, the scientific forms of inference that are used, the, the forms of reasoning that science adopt, aren't even reliable for the truth because, look, here are lots of cases where scientists have gone from the evidence to a commitment to some theory, and it's turned out to be wrong. So whatever methods the scientists are using, they, uh, in the actual world, in the practical world we live in, often produce false conclusions, and therefore we should uh, moderate our commitment to the next theory that comes along. That's that's a perfectly serious uh, uh, argument. That's that, that That's not involving any kind of weird kind of philosophical requirements that we have certainty or anything. That's just pointing out that science keeps on going astray, so you should be suspicious of it. And, uh, okay, so so it's, it's a meta-induction because uh, it's uh, uh, saying in the past science has gone astray, so it will continue to go astray. It's uh, from past falsity, because the cases we're looking at are the past cases where science has produced false theories. And it's pessimistic because uh, the conclusion is we shouldn't trust science. Mm -hmm. So there we are. That's a pessimistic meta-induction for past falsity. And it needs it needs a serious response. And uh, uh, it's, I mean, the response to pessimistic meta-induction is, look, you guys are setting the standards too high. Uh, the response to the... Uh, Sorry, the response to, to undetermination argument is that you guys are setting the standards too, too high. The response we should make to the pessimistic meta-induction is that there's cases and cases. And if we look more carefully, we'll see that uh, the methods of reasoning used in some areas of science are unreliable, but methods of reasoning used in other areas of science, or at least in, in drawing certain conclusions, there's no reason to regard them as unreliable. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I, I I gather from what you said that this is old hack for you. So thanks for, for spelling it out in more detail for me. But moving on to, to the last... Well, let, me, let, me give a, let, me give a, let me give a plug. No, the, the, this, this is kind of uh, bread and butter, scientific realism 101. But there's, there's, a, there's an episode of 
Philosophy Bites. Do you know the Philosophy Bites series? Yeah, yeah, I listened to it. By... Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I did one on scientific realism some years ago where I go through these better butter, bread and butter issues, probably probably better than I I, I, uh, I, I just did just now. So mm. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be directing your listeners off to the competition, no. but if, if, if you want to hear... A, yeah. a, a slower version of what I just said. You can go and listen to Scientific Realism and Philosophy Bites. Oh, sounds good. Well, so the last thing before we move on to causation, where you've been working a lot lately, uh, I wanted to talk mm. about the replication crisis. So I'm aware of it, uh, yeah, main, yeah. mainly because I've just heard about it in psychology. But what is the replication right. crisis in science? And is it endemic elsewhere beyond psychology? Interesting question. Uh, it's not just psychology. So psychology is, is a big area for it. And uh, has some of the most striking examples. It's also in quite a lot of medical research and quite a lot of biochemical research. But maybe you could in say fact, one, what one it of is the, first. <laughs> what, what it is, 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 is that findings that uh, get published in top journals and are generally promulgated as this has now been established turn out to be not replicable and uh, in fact uh, uh, not findings at all. The claim turns out to be false. So I don't mean what, what's there in psychology? What's, what's the best one? The big brother thing. So uh, if you have a honesty box next to the coffee machine people are required to put you know a dollar in every time they make a cup of coffee themselves in the common room uh uh some smart psychologist tried putting a big picture of a human face with prominent watching eyes on the wall and and it turned out that uh the the takings and honesty box went up by 50 percent and uh this was this this was a kind of big fun finding. The papers all published it, and I went uh, when I was head of department, and we had such an honesty box. I went and got the office to go and find a big poster of some watching eyes and put it on on the wall, and uh, and then uh, some people took the trouble to see whether they could replicate this finding, and it turned turned out that they couldn't. In fact. There's no such effect. Uh, people uh, aren't really sensitive to the picture of eyes on the wall. I mean, they might oh, be sensitive really? to real people, but pictures don't don't fill them. You know, it was it was it was a bogus result. And this this is a very widespread thing. So there's something systematic here. So uh, big drug companies, Bayer, got worried that they were putting lots of money into drug development. Uh, that turned out to be wasted because when they finally got to to testing the drugs, they didn't work at all. And they tried to figure out uh, what the problem was. And they discovered that they started off uh, developing the drugs on the basis of of studies that showed that this drug reduced tumors in mice by 30% and so on. And so that looks like very promising that, 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 that let's, let's develop a drug that can be taken by humans and put it through phase one and phase two trials. And, and then it turned out that uh, most of the time they're getting nowhere. And they went back to try find what the problem was. And the problem was that the initial studies, which said that this drug had reduced the mouse tumors by, by whatever it was, 50%, uh, do it again, same drug with same mice, uh, uh, no, same, similar mice, and no result, no result. So, yeah. th th right. So that's that's the replication crisis. And uh, uh, there's, no, 
huge concern. Uh, we can talk about the the cause and the remedy in a minute, but there, there are people kind of going through all the old psychology studies and uh, uh, drug research studies and a lot of uh, 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 clinical med medical studies to, to check whether what's been uh, accepted as pretty well established is in fact uh, 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 good stuff. And I'm just trying to remember the name. There's, there's a big psychology project going through everything, seeing seeing if it's any good. Hmm. And now, I mean, I, sorry, what, what I was referring to right back at the beginning, uh, and we might talk about this, but to my mind. This is an entirely predictable result, and it was predicted by many people, of oh, really? the completely silly statistical methodology that all scientists have been taught for 100 years. And it's really? one of the great intellectual scandals of the modern world that, that this nonsense was taught to scientists and uh, 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 controlled the way that scientists worked and journals decided what to publish for so long. Yeah, what is this? I haven't heard about this before. So have you ever done a statistics course with significance tests? I haven't taken a stats course, no. <laughs> so I'm talking to the right person. So, so what you're taught is you want to know whether some drug has an effect, say, and so you do a study with uh, patients who are given the drug, patients who aren't given the drug, and uh, see whether recovery times are faster in the group that has the drug, right? But of course, what you're going to get is some difference in the mean recovery times in the two groups. And now you might wonder, is this a big difference we've observed or just the kind of difference that might occur by chance? And uh, so you do some statistics. I mean, you have to make some assumptions uh, that the recovery times are normally distributed in the two groups. And so the difference between the means will be normally distributed. And then you do a standard t-test. And right, the other idea is, well, we, we're interested in whether the difference we observe is unlikely to happen by chance. How unlikely? Well, let, let's look for a difference that will only happen one time in 20 by chance. If there's no real difference between the means, we'll get a difference in the, in the samples this big one time in 20. And if we get a difference that's... Uh, so big that such a such a result would only happen one time in 20 there's a cutoff point uh, uh such that uh only one time in 20 do you get a difference bigger than that okay and so if you get a result beyond the cutoff point i.e in the rejection region the significant result then right then that's a result and uh a significant result and the journals will publish it okay and okay, so we now discovered that that eyes on the wall will make people behave better, and 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 this drug at least reduces uh, tumors in mice. Okay, but you see, you should be seeing the problem already. Uh, one time in twenty. Okay, let let let, let let's do. Yeah, how to. Get at this. Okay. Suppose suppose I give you a coin, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a, a, a regular quarter, and uh, and we we're interested in whether it's it's biased. Uh, and so, I mean, we can, we can toss it a pile of times. We can toss it, I don't know, a hundred times. And uh, uh, is it is it biased? Uh, and you might say, well, you know, I I, I got. 40 heads, I mean, that's quite, quite low. Uh, uh, 
must be biased. Now you might think about, hang on, let's not be too fast. Let, 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 let's, let's do the sums and see how often we will get a result of 40 heads or lower or 60 heads or higher. And I mean, I, I haven't done the sums around, but, but it's probably, uh, uh, you can do the sums and you find out that only one time in 20 will you get, get uh, uh, let's say, more than 45 Less than forty-five heads, or more than fifty-five heads. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. Let's make it fourteen sixty. Uh, uh, mm. Okay. So, uh, so right. Once you once you once you get uh, 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 lower than forty and more than sixty, you conclude I've got a biased coin. But note that the whole thing is set up so that one time in twenty, you toss coins, just regular coins, you're going to get a significant result. One time in twenty. You're going to conclude I got a biased coin, but the truth is that scarcely any coins are biased, uh, right? And what's going on here is we're ignoring the base rate somehow. This idea that you got a significant result if it would only happen one time in twenty uh, is somehow trying to arrive at a conclusion. Think about the bias of the coin in abstraction from the question of how likely it is beforehand that you've got a bias coin. Look, if, if we just go around taking coins out of the, the vending machines, it'd be crazy to conclude you had a bias coin every time you got that result. You're going to get it one time in 20, uh, even with perfectly normal coins. I mean, if you're in a magician's house and you're looking around for coins and you find one, and you find it comes down uh, heads uh, less than 40 times in 100, then then you'd have good reason to think it's a biased coin. Yeah. But if you're just getting regular coins out of the vending machine. Okay. Imagine that scientists, the psychologists, and the drug researchers spend all their time looking at effects that aren't there. It's as it were they spend all their time looking at coins that are actually fair. Right. I mean, uh, suppose that I mean, you know, scientists are indefatigable testers of unlikely hypotheses. Right. Right. And, right. And, and, and you know, if you have a bunch of psychologists and they're, and they're testing a uh, uh, hundred hypotheses, uh, 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 and all of these are silly hypotheses, none of them, none of them are a real effect. Right. Well, then, uh, uh, five times in a hundred, one time in twenty they'll get a significant result and it'll get published in the journal. And uh, that's where the replication crisis comes from. I see. It comes from this ridiculous idea that, that something that would only happen one time in 20 by chance uh, uh, is enough re reason to reject the hypothesis that there's no effect and conclude that there's an effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, Very interesting. Just, just to fill, fill in, uh, the whole apparatus significance test. So, so there's an alternative way of thinking about these issues, which is Bayesianism, which in fact is perfectly sensible and logical, but it requires you to start off with an idea about how likely is it that the coin is biased. And I think that if I'm getting coins from a vending machine, I don't know, one in 3,000, I'd say. If I'm getting coins out of a magician's pocket, uh, I'd say maybe one, one, in, one in 10. I don't know. Uh, it, it, you should have a different attitude, right? But the scientists, the official scientists, didn't like the idea that decisions about what to accept should in any way be influenced by your prior uh, empirically un, uncontrolled judgment about how likely the hypothesis is. They're trying to get away from the idea that, I don't know, consensus tells us that bloodletting is good for, for fever. Uh, let's not have any prior ideas. Let's get away from prior ideas. We'll just do significance tests without any any assumption about the prior probability of the hypothesis, but it doesn't work at all. Uh, it's it's just a completely silly silly way of going about things, and th th that's that's classical statistics, frequentism, Neyman-Pearson significance testing, versus Bayesianism, 
and uh, the truth is that uh, significance testing is just a misbegotten idea. And uh, as I say, every scientist who did a statistics course has been taught this for a hundred years. Stopping now, people have realised that, that it was a bad idea. Finally. So then, is uh, am I right to infer from what you've just said that the the best way of combating the replication crisis is to change our methods of statistics? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And I mean, go, go, go and look. Go, go, go and look at. Go and look in the journals now. I mean, do replication. But you, you, you'll find that that that. Uh, uh, Yeah, I mean, what you just said is is is, is now generally agreed, and uh, we have to change. We just, I mean, the the grip of classical significance, statistics, significance testing on the scientific community is so strong that you will find people trying to deal with the problem by by twiddling uh, the old way of thinking about statistical inference but uh probably my sense is the majority of people who address this issue properly and thought about it realize that that's not the way to go that in fact we just have to chuck out the the name and pierce and classical statistics and switch to switch to bayesianism i mean there's different species of bayesianism there's a lot of issues here but uh yeah uh, here's a case where what the scientists thought uh, has turned out to be a really bad idea, and it's philosophers as much as anybody else who've who've uh, uh, managed to bring this about. Well, I wonder then if this is an exception to the view you expressed at the beginning of the podcast that it's been misguided mm -hmm. for philosophers of science to weigh in or spend so much time thinking about methodology in science broadly because this seems like a very clear case in which you've made a clear point or intervention into how science should be conducted broadly that would solve um, problems endemic to science as a whole good so let me let me qualify and uh bring out some some of the points I made in passing, but might have got a lot. So what I'm against is this general Popperian uh, Lakatosh idea that there's a methodology that applies to science in general, that is a demarcation criterion that can show us what's done in science and what isn't. Uh, so that's a general thing. And I said in, in response to that idea, no, that, that that's that's not right. Uh, what we need in different sciences is uh, an understanding of which methods of investigation will be good for getting at the truth. The answer to that question will vary from science to science. The scientists themselves who understand their subject matter uh, will, be, will be the best experts at telling us uh, how to get out, how to go about finding out about that subject matter, which which kind of instruments will work, which kinds of inferences will work, and so on. Okay. So I think that metastatistical inference uh, is just such a case. There's a lot of sciences uh, which uh, have to make do with very noisy data. It's not clear whether the results you're observing are just normal chance fluctuations or something more significant. Uh, and and in those cases, we need some techniques for, for dealing with this kind of statistical noise. So I think of that as kind of something going on within certain branches of science and the scientists are trying to figure out what's the best way of dealing with noisy data uh, it's not like the popo lakatosh yeah. general scientific i see the distinction so okay. Okay. i also say that within science you find problems that are very conceptually tricky to unravel they involve 
kind of confusing assumptions and uh, 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 require us to, to start unthinking things that we take for granted. And that often philosophers are better at thought or, or as good as doing this untangling as the relatively few scientists who uh, uh, regard it as their job to do the untangling. And I think that the, the, the logical statistical inference is just such a case. It's a kind of difficult and confusing area. Uh, and uh, the, the more thoughtful statisticians and the more uh, statistically informed philosophers have, have combined forces in figuring out how this bit of science ought best to be done. Mm -hmm. does, it, does, that, does that address the, address no, the question? No, it absolutely I mean, I, does. I, I, so then... You've you've been working a lot on causation lately, and particularly on its statistical nature. Now, before we get into the st the statistical nature of causation, what is it about yeah. the prior views that are problematic? So, what what is the need for the statistical the statistical model? Good. Uh... So I've got a paper called The Statistical Nature of Causation. I'm not sure I am going to carry on using that name for my theory. I've got a theory okay. of causation. Okay. I mean, it's not it's not entirely original. It takes, it takes elements from lots of things that are lying around in in statistics as well as as well as philosophy. But it does something that other philosophical theories of causation are very bad at. And it's it's to do with understanding how it's possible to infer causes from patterns of correlation. So when we're taught, I mean, everybody's told, you no. Know, Correlation doesn't prove causation, and indeed it doesn't. But there's a connection. Often. It's also true. That, what? Yeah. I was just saying, but it's there's it's, often well, a connection. It's all, but there certainly is a connection, and this connection is very important in many sciences, in particular non-experimental sciences, also, also experimental sciences. But... Uh, so you get more complicated patterns of causation of correlation and you can draw causal conclusions i mean let me just give an example so suppose you find that kids in private schools or more generally you know better funded schools get higher exam results they get higher scores in uh, what's your what's your school leaving exam called the uh, the sats is that uh, SATs school leaving exam? or ACTs? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Sats. So, yeah, you don't call them Sats. You call them SATs. Yeah, they're SATs. Yeah, yeah. I never knew that. I never knew that. And yes, that, that just goes to show. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those examples where you've read. What do you have in South Africa? People, people. In South Africa, we had matric, but uh, no, I, I haven't lived in South Africa for. Right, right, but I know you went to and, you went uh, to Durban High School and was, University just, of Natal. We, we had junior certificate and matric. Matric is what the, the school leaving exam was called. Mm. You know, here, here it's O levels. Well, it's not O levels. It's GCSEs and A levels now. Anyway, we're we're digressing. Yeah. We're digressing. Uh, uh, and this is just an example. Uh, so, so there's a correlation between between schools, school funding, and exam results. You might think that shows school school funding has a causal influence on exam results. But but then suppose you discover that this correlation disappears when, as we say, you control for parental income. So so among the rich parents, uh, there's no remaining correlation between uh, well-funded schools and exam results. Uh, the the kids with rich parents who go to the cheap schools get just as good exam results as the kids that go to the expensive schools. And similarly among the poor parents. Uh, 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 the, the schools don't make any difference, right? And so, so now, now we conclude, look, the schools aren't, aren't having any causal influence on exam results. Uh, 
it's the parental income that's having, uh, it's uh, the home affluence that's having an influence on exam results and the correlation in the schools and exam results were just due to, to the, the parental income influencing both choice of school and and exam results. So there, there's a case where you got some. You just start with correlational data and you infer some causal conclusion. And okay, this is a big business now in lots of sciences. And computer scientists have got involved. And there's Bayesian network theory. That's a whole developed theory showing how how certain correlational patterns are. Uh, indicate certain causal conclusions, and then there's you know quite a lot of uh, 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 debate about exactly how these inferences can break down, and what are the conditions for accuracy, and so on. But so here's another scandal in the area of statistics. I was, I was saying there's a scandal that all the scientists have been taught significance testing for so many years, uh, and. Okay, here's a quite different scandal. This is a scandal within philosophy, not within statistics. The scandal is that philosophers developing theories of causation, none of their theories have anything to say about why that kind of causal inference from correlational patterns to causal conclusions can work. They right. absolutely leave us completely in the dark about what's going on. I mean, th th there's counterfactual theories of causation and yeah. process theories and powers theories and Do the agency theories, theories also have nothing to do with it? Agency theories, good question. I only uh, ask because I've just been talking to Hugh Price. No, and the ag agency yeah. theories are kind of a bit closer. Uh, yeah. But... Agency theories are a bit more involved with correlations than uh, than the theories I mentioned. Right. Whether they can explain why we can infer causal conclusions from patterns of correlation, I don't think they do. Mm -hmm. I don't think they do. In fact, look, there are philosophers who are interested in the patterns of correlation and their connection with right. causation. I think David Albert comes to mind. And they're kind of minority group, people who are familiar with statistics. And they have, I mean, so they're what are called probabilistic theories of causation. And then interventionist theories are kind of close to that. And... Maybe agency theories like Hugh Price's are similar. And if they do explain the connection between causal conclusions and correlational data from which they can be inferred, they do it in a bad way, is my view. They, they uh, 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 don't really try and give us an independent theory of causation that can explain the, the the causal inference. I mean, in 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 economics and uh, uh, epidemiology and uh, data science, this business of inferring causal conclusions from correlations is just called causal inference. And you can buy books on causal inference, and it they go into all the techniques used to make these inferences. Anyway. Uh, with a, with with a few qualifications which I won't make, but but I've got in the back of my mind, and maybe agency theories are part of them. Uh, philosophers are very bad at explaining the possibility of causal inference, and that's that's what I want to do in in the work I'm doing. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's a book I'm 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 writing at the moment, and I think I've made quite a lot of progress. Oh, um, can you can you I'm say a bit about what the about theory it. is or what it looks like? Okay. Uh, so the, the, these correlational patterns that you can observe. Think of what epidemiolo epidemiologists look at the patterns involving smoking and cancer and mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> air pollution. And, 
and so on, and uh, uh, or yeah, they look at patterns involving hypertension and kidney disease and COVID and uh, nutrition, and they figure out what's causing what. And so the truth is that that certain correlational patterns uh, are widely taken to be to be uh, evidence for causal conclusions. Okay, so what's the connection between the correlational patterns and the causal conclusions? Uh, why is it these correlational patterns are evidence for the causal conclusion? Most philosophers don't even ask the question. Most of those who do ask the question say, ah, uh, that's just what causation is. Causation just is the relationship you have between variables, between quantities, uh, uh, when we have these correlational patterns. Causation just is the correlational patterns. Okay, I have various arguments, and they're, they're not just mine, they're well-known arguments, that that can't be right, that uh, there are cases where the causal facts come apart from the correlational patterns. The correlational patterns are misleading about the causal facts. So we can argue that the, the correlational patterns are a kind of symptom, they're evidence, they're a surface manifestation of the underlying causal structures. And so the job then is to explain what the underlying causal structures are and show how they manifest themselves in these correlational patterns. At this point, I appeal to what in the mainly economics tradition are known as structural equations. It just means so we can have, you know, equations saying that, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, exam results are a function of type of schooling and uh, uh, parental income and the number of books in the home and uh, powers of concentration and maybe IQ. And you might just have some equation saying that, that certain values of some of those quantities uh, determine certain values for uh, other of those quantities. So we just have equations specifying how certain variables depend on other variables. But the big challenge then is to explain why this is a matter of some variables being dependent on other variables and those other variables not being dependent on the first. Why do we have a directed dependency here rather than just covariation? And that's the point at which uh, I think that causation becomes statistical. The idea is that when we have structures of quantities that are related by equations, the independent variables, the causes, will typically be statistically independent of each other. Uh, the idea is that if A and B cause C, then, and this is a very simple case, A and B will be statistically independent of each other. And that what, that's what gives the direction to causation. So what I can show is that, and, and this isn't original with me, in fact, this is pretty standard in some statistic literature and it's a pretty trivial proof. That, that if causation is, is constituted by uh, deterministic dependencies, structures of deterministic dependencies, in which the independent variables are all probabilistically independent, if that's what causation is, then causation will manifest itself in correlational patterns in just the way it does. So I think of this account of, of causation as involving uh, deterministic dependencies with, with uh, 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 the independent variables being independent as the best explanation of the causal inference techniques. That's what we have to suppose causation is if we're to understand why causal inference techniques work uh, 
to the extent they do. So this this, this is a uh, a theory about the nature of causation that, that's motivated by the need to to explain the causal inference techniques. And it also has the bonus that it explains the direction of causation. It offers some understanding of why causation always points forwards in time and so on. In fact, it explains explains everything we want to explain. It explains uh, the connection between causation and agency. Uh, it explains uh, what it is for one particular fact to cause another and so on. This, what you've said raises uh, two main questions for me, both of which relate to right. quantum mechanics. So you referred a number of Good. times to uh, determinism, well, determinist uh, tendencies. Uh, so how does that relate to quantum mechanics then, which, as I understand it, is random or not determinist in many ways? It's a big issue how far quantum mechanics really is indeterministic and uh interpretation of quantum mechanics is a complicated business and uh you had david albert and tim maudlin on and uh i mean they're they're philosophers who forced the physicists to think seriously about how to understand quantum mechanics and uh they think there's three serious theories there's the 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 Everettian theory, the multiverse theory, the the Bohmian theory, the hidden variables theory, and the GRW theory, the the, the collapse theory, and only the last is indeterministic. Hmm. But put that to one side, because on all those theories, we certainly have something that looks like indeterminism in quantum mechanics, and we have quantum measurements, or more generally microscopic quantum systems interacting with macroscopic objects. Uh, so I want my theory to accommodate that. And the way I do it is I argue that even if we don't have determinism, we have something that looks like determinism. We have pseudo-determinism, which involves some chancy things going on. But despite the chanciness, the underlying structures, which involve some, some indeterminacy, still behave very much like deterministic systems, and in particular, give rise to the correlational patterns from which we infer infer causation. This is how things generally work. Uh, it's how things work when we have apparent quantum collapses. In the microscopic world, if we carefully control things so we don't have macroscopic quantum collapses, then things will work rather differently. And then we can sometimes find correlations like the like the EPR correlations, uh, correlations between events separated at a spec-like difference, which don't display the kind of correlational patterns that are displayed by normal normal causal structures. So so Here's here's a principle. Perhaps I should have mentioned it earlier that underlies causal inference techniques. One half of the causal inference techniques is a principle often called Reichenbach's principle, which says that if you have a correlation between two variables, if two variables are correlated, then okay, it doesn't mean that one is causing the other, because correlation doesn't prove causation, but it does mean that either one is causing the other or the second is causing the first, or they have a common cause. That's, that's the principle that allows us to start inferring uh, causal conclusions from correlational data. If you have a correlation, there must be some kind of causal explanation of it. And uh, the other thing assumed by the causal 
inference techniques is the is the opposite of that if you if you don't have a correlation then it's not the case that either a is causing b or b is causing a they have a common cause uh, that absence of correlation implies absence of a causal link and in fact that that assumption isn't isn't as as stable isn't as surefire as Reichenbach's assumption but anyway when you have uh, quantum systems that that aren't even pseudo-deterministic then this principle gets violated uh, we have we have correlations between measurements on space-like separated particles where they're space-like separated so it can't be that one's causing the other or the seconds causing the first, at least if we don't want violations of special relativity. And what John Bell showed in Bell's inequality is that these correlations have a structure that can't be due to a common cause. So, so sometimes in quantum mechanics, if we have very carefully controlled circumstances, we have uh, correlations produced by structures that aren't like my deterministic or pseudo-deterministic structures and then the causal inference principles break down so so i've got a whole story it, it gets complicated to accommodate uh, quantum mechanical and determinism mm. and to show how the, the simple story i told you before you asked this pressing question uh, still still goes through effectively enough even after we have the quantum mechanical and determinism well, the the last thing I'll ask. You, you, had two, you had two questions, didn't you? Yeah, exactly. So that's what I'm going to go to is the last question, and it also had to do with quantum mechanics. But more particularly, you mentioned that your theory accounts for the direction of causation, and when right. I spoke with Hugh Price recently, we talked a bit about backward causation, and he right believes or at least thinks it's very much worth exploring that backward causation helps us to make sense of quantum entanglement and i'm wondering how your mm -hmm. theory accounts for the phenomenon we observe the phenomenon we observe in quantum in quantum entanglement if if you've thought about it much at all and if uh, backward causation has at all appeared to you as a viable solution, even though from what I heard, it doesn't figure into your account at all. Yes. Uh... Now, I don't believe in backwards causation. Uh... So causation is asymmetrical. If A causes B, it's not the case that B causes A. And the theory I'm developing accounts for that asymmetry all right in terms of uh, probabilistic independence. So the, the, the causes are the quantities that... Uh, putting it very crudely, a publicity independent of each other. So that tells us which are the causes, which are the effects. Okay. Here's a further fact over and above the fact of causal asymmetry is that when we have these asymmetric cause-effect pairs, they always point in a certain direction in time. They always point from, from the past to the future. So... Uh, that opens the way to explaining the temporal orientation of causation in terms of the temporal orientation of probabilistic independency. And I would look to quantum mechanics to uh, give us an explanation of why, why we have the, the probabilistic independences we do arranging themselves in a certain way. In time, and I, I would take that to be uh, of a piece with the explanations that uh, people give of the asymmetry of entropy increase uh, and the asymmetry of quantum quantum decoherence. 
But you also asked, how are we going to explain quantum entanglement? And, okay, now I haven't said this yet. I'm an Everettian. I'm an Everettian. And I okay. believe in the multiverse solution to, to the... Oh, really? The puzzles of quantum mechanics. Okay. And I... Huh. It isn't everybody? Isn't everybody? I don't think so. Uh, no, no. In, in, in my circles, everybody is. Now, you, you, you should know this: that, that in 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 Britain, all the philosophers of physics are Everettians, pretty much. I'm, 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 I'm. I now I say that it sounds like a kind of silly exaggeration, but I'm trying to think of cases, and I think no, no, it's true. All the philosophers of physics in this country are Everettians, because. Everettianism is the only thing that makes sense of Okay, of the, very uh, interesting. That's mechanic. not well, the, no. the, what I sense here. Yeah, yeah. no, no, no. There, there, is, there is a big British-American difference here. And, uh, uh, and the, the EPR correlations aren't really a puzzle for Everettians. I mean... There's the puzzle that we have quantum systems that are entangled, that the property of the the spread out whole isn't determined by the local properties of the parts. That's that's a weirdness. But that's just how quantum mechanics is. And uh everybody what who has any interpretation of quantum mechanics allows that there's that kind of uh, non-locality uh, the puzzle the puzzle comes when when you have these correlations between observations uh, that seem to depend on signals traveling faster than the speed of light now with with an everett with an everettian interpretation uh, if you work it through uh, nothing's traveling faster than the speed of light. There aren't any influences. It's just to do with uh, different worlds uh, uh, displaying themselves in different ways. So so there's no remaining puzzle about the EPR correlations in Everett. Hugh wants to somehow have... The puzzle about the correlations is is, is this causal puzzle. How, how, how do these two things manage to coordinate themselves when when they can't be influencing each other because of the... the speed of light constraint and and it's not the kind of coordination that could be explained by some prior circumstance so he wants to say oh it's going to be explained by some later circumstance some later circumstances backward causing the correlations uh and uh yeah i'd like to see the details mm -hmm. and uh you asked me it's better to be an everettian than to start going down that Mm. that line line of thought uh yeah we could say a lot more about Hugh's views about causation they're rather they're rather strange i mean he doesn't think that causation is asymmetric he thinks that uh in reality it goes both ways and and uh what's asymmetric is just our perspective on causation myself i think that the phenomena that he uses to make our perspective asymmetric, in fact, are perfectly capable of making causation itself asymmetric and so ruling out backwards causation. Uh, yeah. But maybe that's a, a subject for another time. All right, David. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this has been uh, the most phenomenal introduction to the philosophy of science episode uh, that I could have hoped for. I, as you know, I wanted to talk about the metaphysics of sensory experience. I, I had this ambitious program where maybe we would even get to uh, philosophy and sports or yeah. naturalism or consciousness. But I mean, because you've worked on too much, but uh, maybe those things can wait for another time. But yeah. for now, uh, thank you so much for, for doing this with me. Well, thank you. I mean, I'd, I'd be glad to come back and thank, thank you for having me on. That was a lot of fun. That's great. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart or 
if you're not joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson East, please do so.